very considerable period from at least 4,500 BC through to 600 or 700 AD. And that is rather a longer period than I'd expected when I unwisely took on Richard's suggestion that I spend a year or two digging it. <laughs> a year or 25. <laughs> yeah. And we start, I put the banana barrow. Can everyone read banana barrow? Yes. yes. Oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the cutting C5, which had an anomalous thing in it. A whole series of little holes around a strange shape that Terry you were digging, I think, in 75 or thereabouts. And we didn't know what it was, and the causewood enclosure ditch and bank ran across the top of it. And radiocarbon dates, which have been fairly recently obtained, proved that it was probably 5,000 or even 6,000 BC in it. So that's, that's quite early. <laughs> the causewood enclosure, the rebuilt enclosure, the final enclosure, all of this, um, our radiocarbon dates show, happened within about 250 to 300 years. And that is a bit of a facer for people who have been stretching out the Neolithic period, especially causewood enclosure Neolithic, <coughs> over hundreds and hundreds of years. And they all, it, it's very embarrassing, especially for people who, like some of my friends in archaeology, who believe in um, no invasion <coughs> and an awful lot of economic development and process taking place. It looks awfully like causewood enclosures are an invasion from <laughs> Europe. Um, and, but I will not go taking <laughs> um, And then we have the cairn, about which I may say a few words, and then the long mound, which seems to stretch across from um, the period of the cairn, somewhere around 2,500 BC, running right on, perhaps, until its <coughs> demolition in the beginning of the Iron Age. And the dating for that is a tiny piece of Hallstatt um, bangle found in the uh, broken, <coughs> in a hole next to a broken stone of the Long Mound, a stone that had been kicked inwards like all the ring of the Long Mound bar one stone. They'd all been smashed inwards by pe personal people standing outside it saying, enough of this and kicking it in. And there's a little bit of Hallstatt uh, bangle that fell in beside it, and that should be about 600 BC, just about the time that our long houses are being formed. So the Long Mound is an extraordinarily long um, <coughs> epoch within um, what we understand of the settlement. And then we have our hill forts, which seem scarcely to be distinguished in date. They're somewhere around 600, maybe 500, maybe 450 BC. And then we get the rebuilding of the Long Mound, or at least its reuse as the Small Mound which uh, sealed a ro uh, an early Roman road coming up from the valley and passing into the former camp. Uh, and then we have a date for 3C, which is about 4 or 5 BC, plus or minus 4 as a, t a thermoluminescent date. From a hearth, and that is about the same sort of date as the birdlip mirror. So it is possible that th at that period, which I used to call uh, period four in the 1969 report, uh, that may well be um, connected or at least contemporary with the royal, the princess burial at Birdlip.
on the hill just above Critley. And we finally end up with the Dark Age phases, which um, are post-Roman and seem to start at any rate in the 4th century and may go through the 5th century. And who knows, they may go as far as 577 or thereabouts when... Um, it's good for sauce. <laughs> well, that's, that's when Gloucester is captured and various other towns and we start getting an Anglo-Saxon presence according to the history of the area. When I say history, I should say history of the area, because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is a bit dodgy in this early phase. But we're, we're, this is where we've got to, and you see we're somewhere around there for our phase. And it does rather look, I mean, Alan, uh, who's done a lot of work on this, may well disagree with me, and we'll find out when his volume comes out. But, um, it does rather look as though at the end of the Roman period, the Roman villas are being abandoned. Um, the, I, either because they weren't very safe or because the people who owned them had gone off to nice places like Brittany <laughs> in the 450s, as Gildas seems to be describing. Um, and that um, there is a recession uh, up into the hills. <coughs> Um, there's certainly along the Sunset Hills as well, there are people going up and reoccupying hill forts um, in this sub-Roman or post-Roman phase before the final Anglo-Saxon formation of kingdoms, which is quite often as late as the um, 7th or even 8th century. So, now uh, I try and find... Oh, that's it. Good. Um, this is simply, I, th I suppose, to show you that it's a quite a complicated site. You've all got that, have you? Yeah. Not only is it complicated as far as time is concerned, but um, I think so. Um, as we go over the site from the entrance up here down to the Long Mound, down there, we've got phases and buildings and all sorts of things. And on this drawing, Unlike other drawings, I haven't shown the area we haven't excavated. And there is quite a lot that we haven't excavated, but unfortunately other people have. And the whole of this area there, and an area there, and various other areas have been quarried away. So we don't know what's there. So, <laughs> this is 1970. 1970. Uh, a hot year, and you can see people digging all over the entrance area. Here is the hornwork. There, the entrance passageway. There, a bastion. There's a bastion on the other side. And everyone is young and enthusiastic, and stone, <laughs> stone disappeared at enormous speed from the. Um, here. Yeah, yes. We may have all the lights on. Uh, Try this one. Two on the right. There's one behind you, Paul. There's one up there. Anyone got any lights? That's better. That's better. Yeah. Any more? Uh, oh. yeah. Well done. What's up, guys? He's no albatross. <laughs> Here, um, on the left-hand side, we can see the inner side of the um, of the uh, South Bastion with uh, John, dear John, and his then wife Myrtle about to put a pickaxe through it. Uh, that, I think, looks like the backside of Judy Young, <laughs> Chris Young's wife. And if I'm not mistaken, that is Richard Savage. That's right. <laughs> With his hat, um, marking him out, about to start work on Post Hill 6 which turned out to be a nightmare. And there was a lady called Selina Springbet. Oh, yeah. 
Oh. Some of you remember. <laughs> you ended up, I think, in the Western Archaeological Trust, didn't she? Um, later on, who spent most of her fortnight here upside down in this post hole um, because the post hole ended up a metre and a half wide and about a metre and a quarter deep. And she had to dig it out from the top. It was tremendous. And Richard Bryant, I think that is your hat. <laughs> the, this is 1969, and this photograph I took almost immediately before a large piece of masonry fell onto the hat <laughs> and preserved you, though not, I think, your Panama. <laughs> Uh, we were very careful in case the wall fell, but we weren't so careful about rocks falling out of the section. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> that was pre Health Safety at Work Act. Oh, what, uh, sorry, I, I missed that for now. <laughs> <laughs> and here is the great cutting of 79, 1979, just starting taking the turf off. It was all the diggers, including our John, and um, this is a 10 meter wide cut um, with a ditch down here, and it's, it's the biggest rampart cut we actually ever dug, and pretty tremendous actually, and uh, a little later on, uh, that's what it became, with the, uh, the wall, the front wall still standing about 12 feet high and the back wall from an earlier phase standing as you can see another 12 feet behind it and that is the rampart top of the front wall that's the walkway of the front wall and this rampart rose quite a lot higher at the, it's a really quite an impressive thing and you can see that whatever they're trying to do they're showing off they're, they're building something that really is going to um, make a statement to anyone approaching it, whether or not they're intending it as a serious defense. And then, of course, we have the pre-drone experience. <laughs> and you can see Terry and Darwell and Paul and Biggles. Uh, all laughing like mad as they carry the part of the tower to some other impossible position so they can balance on the top of it. And here, the sort of thing, to, this was actually I took from the top of a ladder, um, a decorator's ladder, um, balanced on the top of the spoil tip. Um, so I'm really quite impressed that it came out at all. And there you can see the entrance passageway coming through. That's where we were today, with the South Bastion, the North Bastion, and the two tiers of Period 3 wall. And all the trees of the interior, which I don't talk about much now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it probably looked like. But you know, all of you who have Volume 1 will know this image. <laughs> And uh, look at the date in the corner, 94. Yep, mm -hmm. for the publication, it says. Come on, little things. <clears throat> ah, no, that corner. Some of you may know that I hate and despise Microsoft Windows, <laughs> um, but uh, it works. And here is Richard with his plate camera taking superb, enormous photograph negatives of the great two-stage wall before some of it fell off. <laughs> <laughs> And here, uh, that's the post hole, post hole six that I was talking about. Quite a big one, you see. Yeah. Um, there's another one matching. This is the period two entrance. 
was a back gate here and a pen for trapping people <laughs> in there and then you go on and into the longhouse space. And here, I think we see Dr. Peel measuring. The scarf is pretty yeah. diagnostic. <laughs> Uh, and Marion Barter. That's Marion, yeah. Um, in the most important of our great um, pits behind the rampart, because this contained half the Iron Age pottery on the site mm -hmm. in this rubbish pit. Mm -hmm. Mounting, I suppose I can recall <laughs> something like that. Just, just, just inside the National Trust property, property isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the National boundary, Trust boundary. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a very significant pit from that point of view. It's the one that large horse's head was found in. At the it? very top, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was in the, that was in the bulk? Yes, it did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 Flares, oh. look at that. <laughs> oh. And Parker with hair on the left, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Here we have Julian the half the man. Um, <coughs> and the great pit beside it. And it's probably significant because it's at the edge of the settlement, and so it's provided. Um, a suitable rubbish dump for people living in the adjacent houses. They did, I did a survey in Volume 1 which actually suggested that the other pits, of which there are four or five around the circuit, actually had less and less of the rubbish in it, in them, um, depending on how far they were from the roundhouse settlement houses, thus suggesting that rubbish is taken as little distance as possible from the use of the country. And then advancing inwards, we can see the final Neolithic enclosure with its entrance coming in through there and its great ditches. And here, rotating through 90 degrees, we can see the ditches up here and the causeway the enclosure oh, ditches right. which underlie the bank here. And the real oddity is not that this, these ditches were cut and later filled in, but that they bothered to dig a new set of ditches outside it, rather than if they wanted an enclosure reopening these ditches. And they, not only did they not do this, but at one point, they broke into the side of an earlier ditch which had been backfilled and they stopped and built a wall and bent the new ditch out. So they obviously believed that something had been buried in these earlier ditches that they didn't want to let out. <laughs> and we don't know what it was and we don't know whether they were mad about it, but um, that's what they were clearly doing. And then they built the, this series with a very flat bank behind it. And the bank is not, it's, it's had, what, uh, 4,000 years to erode, which is fair enough. Except that some of it looks very much like top surface already and not eroded. Um, some of this has fallen into it, and we found that, but not very much. And then the fence that went with it was back here. And that is because I suspect that this is actually, on this stretch across there, a killing ground for bowmen mm -hmm. who were standing behind the fence and they had a ditch and then an area of 10 metres or so of, for people who climbed out of the ditch uh, and were vulnerable um, as they came across the flat platform. And one of the reasons, of course, for thinking these things is that on the interior we found burning of houses and structures and so on um, but we also found a huge number of arrowheads and some of the arrowheads were burnt and had been burnt 
um, it was their shafts and the, the resin that glued them, the flint, onto the shafts already fire damaged and they've been used pretty certainly as fire arrows being fired into the settlement. Um, before I pass there, just see the long mound yes. on that side, showing up quite nicely there. And so we've got a phase in which we've got causewood enclosure ditches and probably a settlement about there and fences running in to the settlement and another road coming up from the valley and then coming up here um, in and then out with originally three entrances that way and then eventually um, the whole of this is destroyed by arrows by fire and so on and that's the neolithic down here here is the iron age that i'll talk about in a moment at that end but before i do that um, here is a distribution of leaf arrowheads that's the black dots and you see there's the fence at the back with all the arrows lying in the fence line and there's an entrance with arrows clustering. There's an entrance with arrows clustering, scattering back on the interior yeah. and into the middle. It all looks pretty decisive, actually, as a battle. But I've also put on pebbles, some of which were certainly Iron Age. And here's a, um, Iron Age pebbles found in this area of the Iron Age defences, because they were using uh, slingshots pebbles and slingshots down there. But what I found rather to my surprise when I put them together is there's a huge number of pebbles mixed up with the arrows. So I think that they're using leaf arrows in the battle in the Neolithic and also sling stones in the same fight because that's 10 pebbles there, 12 pebbles there. 140 right. pebbles down there. Um, would, this if they were in groups good. like that, wouldn't that suggest that they were st stacked to go out? Um, not necessarily, because these are these are 140 in a um, four squares. Of okay. C4. It's not that the, there's only one area, and that's there, where the pe there's 100, no, 300 pebbles together. I'm with you. Uh, the rest are yeah, yeah, just yeah. pebbles scattered around. We thought perhaps these are for cooking. Did you heat a pebble up, get it white hot, throw it into a jug, and then boil a piece of uh, beef in it or something of the sort? This is possible, but very few of them showed fire damage, the pebbles. Some of them showed shatter damage, which is probable when you hit something like the rock if you're firing a pebble uh, in a sling stone. So, what? I don't know, it's, it rather suggests sort of mixed, mixed artillery fire yeah, into know. the camp. Um, there are problems with the long mound. Um, here are some of them. The northern end is about 3550 BC. The middle section is about 300 years later. These are radiocarbon dates. The southern end is about 4, 490 BC. It contains items pushed into it from the Roman period. And uh, the latest piece of metalwork put into it is a knife blade of the 17th century. When I say put into it, this is digging a hole into the earth of the long mound till you get down to the um the neolithic ground surface basically and placing something there and then backfilling it <laughs> dedications i think and when i when i gave when i talked about this 17th century knife to a, a bunch of ladies from the wii from the forest of dean um uh, i'd been used to a sort of goodness goodness and they all just nodded <laughs> They've heard of this one, I think. 
<laughs> and there's Long Mount with its phasing and uh, so on, which we will have to deal with. The top surface of the cairn, which precedes the Long Mount, had these grooves on it, and very problematic. Um, we tied it for DNA in case there was blood residue, but we, um, nothing came up. And we weren't surprised really because it was very close to the surface and um, water percolation would, is not likely to have preserved it. But it looks very much like Ronald's coming off a flat platform. So it's possible that we're looking at animal sacrifice. What, what scale is that? Is that, is that um, the, this what, is, what area are we looking at? There? Uh, it's about uh, 30 metres by 10. Okay. Or a bit less. <coughs> Um, eight meters that way, about 30 meters away. Yeah. Uh, and then over the top, we've got the mound with its slabs placed along the edge. And each of these runnels ends with a sacred slab on it. So it's altogether very odd, and there's a circle. I'm not yet the slabs had, had artifacts underneath them, didn't they? Um, mostly animal bones yeah. butchered, yeah. cut marks, placed animal bones placed, and then a slab placed yeah. on top. Yeah. We used to call these the sacred slabs <laughs> because that's what they rather looked like. And um, they measured on the hole about five meters apart. <coughs> Very odd. We were predicting them and finding them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there you can see That's the, circle, the circle, yeah, with the large altar stone there, and the, the mound partially excavated with the grooves starting to appear, mm -hmm. and the sacred slabs being left at the ends of the rumbles. So the, um, there are two issues here. One is, what are these rumbles? They're too small to be fence lines or uh, something of that sort. But um, they're also, so far as we can tell, rather earlier than the, the sacred slabs. So whatever they are, there is a memory of them, or they survive for rather longer than we'd expect for people to seal them up in this fashion. It's all very odd. Which year is that, Phil? Uh, about 83, yeah. maybe 82. Oh. Mm. 83. 83, do you reckon? We dug this area th over three years. Um, 82, 83, 84, I think. Yes, there was, there, was a, there was a worn pavement in the circle, wasn't it? This is, yeah. And once we took the circle away, which we did, here's all the slabs of the circle pushed inwards and it's in lying flat. Um, we found the, a, a lovely groove where they've been uh, put. Um, underneath, we found a Neolithic shrine with its open end here, just a U shape of stone, and an altar or a burning place in the front of it. And these slabs sat directly, uh, sort of one foot above the Neolithic burning spot. So the whole thing is a, a deeply worrying series of memories. And every time I thought, well, you know, this is amazing. This was 500 years later, and it's a thousand years later. Every time I thought that, I looked up from there and looked across, and there's Gloucester Cathedral. And I think, well, of course, that's been there since so, Caroline. When did it start? Then? <laughs> when was the Abbey? About 650 or something? Yeah, 600. Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, religion can hang on or hang around for quite a while. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's it. And then there's the bit w we went to Emma's Grove. And um, here's a drawing I did years ago. And we found a gro uh, in the excavation, we found a groove in the last phase Neolithic ditch. And I've put this dotted line around that ditch. And that's the fire barrier. And then here's the Long Mound in its circle in the Long Mound Valley. And there's three posts there 
which end up at, I think, one of them got a radiocarbon date of late in the Bronze Age, just there. And this shaded area is the area inside the Iron Age Ring Plant where you could see whatever they're doing there because of the contours. You can actually walk along to this burning area and walk through there or walk to it and see. But that's, those three posters form a screen which prevent this view. And then all this dotted area, you can't see the Longman Valley at all unless you cross the area of the burning. Because it's dead ground. This is dead ground, that's underneath dead ground. And so this circle of burning um, prevents p access to people who believe in that sort of thing. And if you don't believe in that sort of thing, well, it doesn't matter because you're not, you're not spying on the ritual that is going on here. Uh, is how I read it. Um, but except that from Emma's Grove, which is somewhere down here, um, you can see right along there and see what's going on. Some of you may have looked up at the right moment and seen the Longman Valley, so you can actually see what's at the, uh, at the other end and see the smoke and find figures, because their eyesight was a good deal better than ours, we're pretty certain. Um, as, the, as we know from the 17th and 18th century, when people could count soldiers at a mile on, on hillsides. Um, and they could see action happening, but they didn't know what was the actual nature of the happening. And this led them to revere the people who were doing it without actually being able to copy what they were doing. And so it reinforced the power of the people who were in charge, which is what practically all of these political activities are about. There's a sacred slab taken off just over there, and here is a cow gone butchered, clearly butchered, laid on the ground, and uh, this is the long mound soil with the sacred slab placed on top of it. So there is something weird going on there, and uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, it certainly, I, I, I get less worried about religion than many archaeologists do since half of my life is spent inside cathedrals but advising I mean, deans I mean, and chapters about these things but um, <coughs> hey, this, this is a, a weird thing and um, lots of people have said oh no it's a, a rabbit warren <laughs> to which one can only reply with a, root that, a word that even after the nine o'clock deadline, I would not use. Um, but is good enough. Uh, balderdash is the, uh, the word. It's not a rabbit war, and it was here 2,000 years before bloody rabbits were introduced into this country, and, um, and so on and so forth. But um, rabbits didn't take bones down into their burrows. Not often, no. Not no. that size. Not that size. They're very good at measuring regular. Absolutely. Every five meters a rabbit can <laughs> 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 Whoops. Have you looked at where the soil came from? Yes. Um, Bob Alvey, um, oh, late lamented, Bob. dear Bob, sadly Bob died a couple of years ago. He did um, soil analyses and snail analyses and reckoned that the snails showed a wide range of soils uh, to the point that it's possible that the soils were brought from um, the top, the, the slopes, and the bottom of the hill, which suggests that there is some sort of communal enterprise of uh, deliberately chosen soils from different areas brought up by people of different sorts from the neighbourhood, but on the whole, it's it's local soil. But it's not necessarily soil from our site, and it's almost totally free 
of Neolithic pottery and flint, which suggests that it's wherever it, it's imported stuff, because any soil taken from the the site, the slopes of the Long Mount Valley, would include quite a lot of, of flint and pottery, and then this this is being brought from a neutral site somewhere else. And then we proceed to the longhouses, which there was great dispute, oh, 14, <laughs> five years ago. And Barry Cunliffe still doesn't agree with me on it, but he's wrong. <laughs> 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 and there are more and more people saying we found other longhouses and so on. And uh, anyway, uh, one of the reasons, he wants that to be a four-poster and this to be another four-poster. Had to be another four poster arranged in rows, and it's it's, it's fantasy. Um, but um, there are hearths, remains of hearths, admittedly, and not well built stone hearths. But all of the hearths belonging to the period two, that is the longhouse settlement, have been damaged because they were on the surface when people were trampling over that surface in period three, mm. the subsequent phase. And here's the roadway coming back from the entrance. And this is house A1 and that's house A2 on the other side of the roadway. And there's what the great roundhouse starting to appear over there. And here's the structures that probably belong to period two. That is to say the longhouses with the entrance coming back and the four posters scattered around. And you see that unlike Danebury and other places like Moili Gaia, um, the square structures are scattered. They're not in rows. Danebury's got five rows of them spaced tremendously regularly right across. And Danebury is almost certainly a, a brain storage depot for the region. Whereas this looks to me very much like a grain storage and working area and structures, sheds, man sheds that belong to the various <laughs> houses that exist here. And at the edge here, we've got towers. And over here, right behind the rampart, overlooking, uh, and with a horde of pebbles just there in the pit. Uh, and th those, that would be where slingers would fire across the ramparts at anyone approaching. Not particularly successfully, it has to be said. And here are two new drawings I've done of um, the Longhouse Settlement with its roadway coming back there with the houses and the four posters, probable granaries. And here, an elder drawing of the, the subsequent roundhouse settlement. And they're so different that it's difficult to suppose that it's the same group or community or people <coughs> who've just decided that round has become fashionable. Um, it's, it really feels to me increasingly strongly that we're looking at two quite separate communities. Where, where are the bread ovens on the on the left hand side? Sure. Um, they would be in this area here, because this is where we get the largest. I might have shown a, a picture of Dorb, numbers of Dorb, um, in a later slide. But um, what what we don't get is Dorb in this area, or in that area. We get Dorb in that area, and in this area here. And Mayhill Sandstone, on the whole, is in the same area, which suggests that bread making is taking place away from this settlement. Mm. When you take the weight of a quernstone, you can see that there's some sense in not having that as a portable object. <laughs> And this is, I've forgotten his surname, I keep forgetting his surname, James, yeah, I can't remember. I've got it wrong in volume two, it's another of the things I've got to change. 
But uh, this is a model maker, a railway modeler. Elton. Who? Elton. Did Your name's Elton, James Elton. E L T H A N. Elton, as in the town. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. James Elton. He was a model maker of railways, and I gave him the plan of the house, House 5, and said, can you make a model out of this? And he uh, spent a little time. He worked for us in the um, Crickley Hill project uh, in Cheltenham. And he came up with this, which coincidentally, I think, because he hadn't actually looked at any reconstructions or done any development or anything. He just looked at the plan and worked from it. Um, it coincidentally looks almost identical to the prehistoric houses found in Europe, of which there are hundreds and hundreds going right back to the Neolithic. So um, I'm more convinced by this model, which will be, I'm sure, in due course in the Crickley Hill Museum when it's up and running on site, um, then I am about uh, quite a lot of hand-drawn things, because this one is actually quite clearly standing. It's put together in the standards. And then we get the great roundhouse, uh, which is part of a long cultural tradition in Wiltshire. It's a Wessex tradition, no problem there. And it has an outer wall lining up with the porch. The, the, among the many oddities, however, is that the porch is turned away from the entrance. And to get to it, you have to walk around on either side. And there are round, little roundhouses on both sides of it. So it's, it's very deliberate in its, um, in its planning. And there you can see a hearth, central hearth, um, post holes belonging to the earlier longhouse underneath and upon that side. And as it's probably, I think, a shrine belonging to the earlier phase. The a f a five post hole. And here's the settlement plan of the roundhouse settlement you see that the roundhouses are complete it's a completely different plan it's a settlement uh, that uh, show that owes nothing to its predecessor at all and um it too has got clusters but here the clusters seem to go with individual houses more as sheds at the bottom of the garden of the individual houses <laughs> And there uh, you see a model which uh, puts these things together. It makes a workable village of it, but um, it was a village that was uh, that, one, that was destroyed, and we found quite a lot of metalwork in it and uh, glass and so on. But one of the oddities is that the settlement is here, and practically all. The iron and bronze rings, ring-headed pins, and so on, are elsewhere, <coughs> where we have no sign of occupation. Um, since many of these are dress fittings, um, I think well, this is after nine o'clock, so you, you can see where my <laughs> thoughts are going. <laughs> um, this is. In the bundooks at the back of the site, <laughs> and and necklaces and all sorts of things found up up at that end. Um, hmm. I, I promised people not to talk about that, so I won't. Um, many of you will remember the utter boredom. Of digging on parts of Crickley, you can see that these good souls have painstakingly emptied innumerable rabbit, rodent, and stake holes from underneath the long mound and tried to make some sort of sense of them. Uh, it's a horrific sort of job, but it's absolutely, it was necessary. <coughs> and hundreds and hundreds of diggers 
and managed to make some sort of sense out of this pattern. And it was all due to Ollenwood, which uh, has now sadly all gone. And there's the dining room and the dormitories and the ablutions block. And uh, rows and rows of little sheds, I think that's Indeed. Dave Southwood there. Mm -hmm. And that looks like a very... at the end. Yeah. And that looks there. like Steve. And there's the whale. Mike the Whale. Mike the Whale. Yeah. 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 And I was much younger at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Still wearing a tie. Yeah. I can't imagine why. Started, <laughs> and um, Just come back this, this is a picture. <laughs> I put this picture up particularly because it shows an era when I was thinner than Terry. You both almost also appear to be digging. Anyway, thank you very much. I've so much enjoyed this weekend. Thank you to Julian, thank you to Richard, and thank you to all of you who have brought back so many shatteringly sad memories to me <laughs> of uh, what has been um, surely not 50 years since we started doing this. Um, it seems like only a drop in the period of time, perhaps five years ago or six years ago, and when some people say, well, you stopped digging in 92. I say, yeah, well, that's all right. Then. Ten years ago, wasn't it? And somebody, and somebody, and they say, no, 25. Uh, yeah. Anyway, my thanks are due to all of you, to the five and a half thousand poor souls who were cajoled into coming along and spending their hard-earned cash on us. Because uh, many of you will remember that actually we charged all of these diggers for turning up and though we fed them superbly and remember that the only people paid on site over the many years were the corpse yes. and um, think of all that lovely range from Tony the cook who was rather like a Chaucerian cook actually in many of his Habits and uh, <laughs> Betty, 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 Betty was the great cook. Betty was great, yes. Carol was good. Yep. And then the Myrie, Ken and Dave. Ken and Dave were a niche. But Betty Grubb yes. was the great cook. She had been the head chef at Walker Crossweller um, in Cheltenham until she retired. She had fed 2,000 men every day and she came up and she had no trouble feeding. <laughs> that was the fairy turkey era. Well, yes, fairy turkey. Lots of people didn't like eating rabbit, but they weren't told it was. <laughs> I liked her vegetarian cooking, like she said. So it must be the beef stock groups I put in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was one of the old school. <laughs> and she insisted on having... The, this was the period at which um, I've gotten the lady from Derbyshire MP um, who... Edwina Curry. Uh, this was the period at which she quite rightly said that our eggs were mostly poisonous. And uh, people were saying, you know, never feed yokes to uh, a passing stranger or something and um, Betty insisted that a man could not go out to work without a running egg <laughs> <laughs> bless her bless her and she, she um, our habit for those of you who uh, weren't on the site or in the camp was that uh, four or six depending on the numbers Volunteers each day spent the morning scrubbing up and uh, peeling potatoes <coughs> and doing things like yes. that, yes. making yes. sandwiches, yes. doing all those things. And Betty stood in the middle like some sort of Napoleon, yes. um, got done. pointing and shouting. <laughs> and they, they did it. 
right? I've, I've seen a, a sort of row of enormous Leicester, Leicester uh, rugby <laughs> playing people sent the unwillingly by their department to come and dig with us. And they were unwilling largely because, Terry, we put them onto cutting U97 <laughs> and U96 where they found nothing in at least a fortnight's digging. And um, there was a bunch of them volunteered to do chores and they were all standing and they were about four foot taller than Betty was. <laughs> and she had them running around, that's not clean enough. <laughs> Wonderful woman. <laughs> and so over the years we've had a tremendous and not, a lot of fun from talking and seeing people and um, a lot of good friendships but um, and there were one or two like Paul and Rosie who ended up as tremendous friends even though by accident we put, put them in the same time. Rosie, yes, yes, Paul and Rosie. Oh yes, uh, by mistake we thought they were a, a couple when they were right. <laughs> <laughs> and they were too polite to object. <laughs> It, it turned out after a while that they'd merely got off the bus and <laughs> 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 yes. But I think they ended up actually, I think, sailing around the world together. <laughs> 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 oh, dear me. Yes. Only a bit of bivouac tent. <laughs> yeah, it was quite, we only had bivouacs, yeah, yeah. quite small <laughs> That was, that was an understandable mistake when you see two people walk in together. <laughs> and that, my lord, is the <laughs> case for the defence. <laughs> 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 anyway.